The title of this talk was Unified Mathematical Field Theory. Get the math right and all else will follow. My name is Doug Sweetser. I gave this talk at the Spring New England APS meeting at Wheaton College on April 2nd, 2016 to about a dozen folks. Now we're more used to unified field theory, which comes from this one-to-one -one mapping between gravity and electromagnetism. Newton wrote this law in the 1600s, where we have the inertial mass times the acceleration, a force, equals minus, that means it's an attractive law, this gravitational constant big G, which was only figured out 100 years after he wrote it down, and the gravitational mass times the passive gravitational mass over R squared. It's an inverse squared law. Now, when Ben Franklin started doing experiments on electromagnetism, he discussed his results with the fellow Joseph Priestley in London, I believe. And when he heard of the results, he said, well, that must be an inverse square law just like gravity. And it was Coulomb who later quantified all this. And yes, this is the static law, the inertial mass times the acceleration, a force, equals plus, oh, that means like charges repel, uh, a, grav uh, a constant, which was very different from G, then uh, one charge times another charge over ma uh, distance squared. So it's real easy to say, golly, Unifying these should be just so straightforward since there's so much overlap between the two. So why doesn't it happen? Well, it's the weak equivalence principle that breaks the one-to-one -one mapping. Now, everybody noticed this before, that yeah, you get to cancel those two, but it was Einstein who realized the significance of it. Because now that gravitational force just has one player in it, just this, this gravitational mass. How far or away from you determines the geometry for all. I mean, it doesn't matter what you weigh. I mean, you can even be a massless photon and you're going to be affected by gravity. Whereas EM stays with three players in the game. You've got these two charges, and they trade photons back and forth, and exactly how they do that trade determines whether the mass that is going to be attracted to this situation or is going to be repelled. So now we have two very different force laws. Well, have we ever had something that was geometry for all? Well, the, an example of geometry for all is the invariant interval of special relativity. We've got this distance squared thing going on, which was kind of known to the Egyptians, <laughs> so that was really old school. But Einstein brought in this t squared thing, that if you were walking to or from it, as long as you took into account this t squared, it was okay. He figured out all the physics and the logic, and there is a lot of fun logic to special relativity. But he wasn't so good with the math, so he asked his buddies what kind of math was he doing. Einstein was told that he was using semi-Riemannian geometry, which uses tensors and metrics. The metric is this g mu nu thing, and I've written the events as p mu and p nu, and we do this contraction, and there we've got it, the invariant interval of special relativity. It's that minus sign that makes the logic of special relativity so fun. But what's so special about special relativity is that all the uh, uh, observers have to be moving at a constant velocity. What do you do if that's not the case, which is often the situation? And you need to change the geometry by changing the metric. 
Well, the way to do that is use the field equations of general relativity to determine the metric tensor. So there I've written out the Einstein field equations, and they are basically kind of like 10 nonlinear differential equations that you need to solve. And it's next to impossible to do. Schwarzschild was able to do it by assuming all kinds of symmetries that led to only four nonlinear differential equations, and that's the solution that's shown there. But the math here is like crazy hard. And yet that's kind of odd, because a square is crazy simple. My goal is to build a square for a number that's actually built for space-time, where numbers are transient, because it's space-time. So what do I mean by that? Well, if you think of an event happening right here, well, that happened a second ago. Uh, well, actually, now it's happened five seconds ago. And as longer you wait, <laughs> the numbers keep moving. It's, it's in, not a pleasant characteristic of numbers in space-time, but I think um, we have to deal with it eventually. Uh, we won't do so uh, really too much more in this, this particular talk, but it's, it's something to, bo to bother yourself with. All right. So what do I mean specifically by numbers? Okay. I'm going to use two different sets. One is the set with zero in it, and the other is the set with one in it, because it was, I believe, Piano, uh, a mathematician, who said that if he had zero and one, he could build up every other kind of number. One of the numbers that he could build up is the positive real numbers, and I also use that. So we also have two operators, the plus operator, and it's always going to have a star topology, which means everything connects to something, and that something is zero. And we're going to have the multiplication operator, and the rules for that come from group theory. For the real numbers, we use the group Z2. It's called this a cyclic group. Um, and it's also called the sine group. Then, because we're reductionists, we'll think about Z1, the trivial group, which is anything but trivial. Z4 is needed for multiplying complex numbers together. And finally, we'll get to the quaternion group Q8, which will be rich enough to deal directly with space-time. So let's start with the familiar real numbers that uses the group Z2 for the multiplication rules. OK, let's start with our addition, where I now view the real number line, you know, with 0 sitting in the middle, as really more about topology. What it's saying is that if you want to connect the positive numbers with the negative numbers, well, you have to go through zero. I have written the, num the negative numbers as i squared. And I did that because when we get to the multiplication rules for complex numbers, we'll use i, i squared, i cubed, and i to the fourth actually brings you all back to one. So there's that cyclic nature of it. And it's, you know, it's just a different way to write it and works just as well. The multiplication side, I'm showing graph theory. That means you start at a vertex, you go on an edge, or pipe cleaner in my case, and you come back to a vertex. And I love how complicated zero is. <laughs> zero times zero is zero, true. Zero times one, that would be in white, is zero. And zero times i squared is zero. I realized I've, I actually could make it more complicated. I should also show that 1 times 0 is 0, and i squared times 0 is 0. The abelian cyclic group Z2 is shown in that little table down there, where like ends up being like E, or positive 1. And if you 
have two that are different, then you end up being like I squared. So this has the uh, identity white bunny years where that means that one times one is one or, or I squared times one is I squared. And the way to go from I squared over to one is to multiply it by another I squared. Okay, so now we're reductionists. We looked at Z2. What about the trivial group Z1? Well, it's simpler than the reals, but it is far from trivial. For addition, we have 0 plus 0 equals 0. Now, 1 plus 1 equals 2, and that's no longer the trivial group. It's That's bigger. Um, it doesn't form a group. It's not closed under addition, uh, to say it in the fancy way. And we look at our multiplication graph theory, and we go, well, 0 times 0 is 0. And we could say 1 times 1 is 1. But there are two things I want to notice about this. One is that 0 has both addition and multiplication. And that's usually what you mean by being a mathematical field. Unless you look it up in a technical book and they say, and there's another qualification. That is that the additive identity must be different from your multiplicative identity. Now, why'd they do that? They did that because people use mathematical fields to study change. But if your additive identity is equal to your multiplicative entity identity, like this in this case, then you can't change. You are stuck. <laughs> and I think that's hugely important. Because if you ask any artist, the, 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 it's very important to know what your background is. So if you are studying change, you have to understand what does not change. And if you're thinking about change in space-time, what does not change in space-time? Think about it for a while. I think what does not change is an observer saying this is here now. I say this about myself. I'm always here. <laughs> I'm always the center of my own personal universe. You can be the center of your own personal universe. A, a, a gas molecule in between uh, galaxies, they are also the center of their own universe. And the amazing thing is that we can go from one moment and one place in space-time to the next. How do we do that? We don't even pay f to do that. And if you don't pay for it, it sounds to me like 0 plus 0 equals 0. So this could be really deep. <laughs> All right. The trivial group represented by the set 1 and multiplication can actually be continuous. In other words, we could take the set of all positive real numbers, multiply it by 1, and we would get a continuous group. Same would not happen with 0, because 0 times all the positive numbers ends up with just 0. And I think that's a, a very important qualitative thing. So you say, well, which one should I use? And I think the answer is, you need to use all of these all the time. And you say, well, that's kind of going to be confusing and weird. <laughs> it's like, yeah, that's a good thing. Because physics is kind of confusing and weird at a very fundamental level. And the trivial group may help uh, us under appreciate in new ways this fundamental weirdness in physics. At least that's my hope. All right, so let's move on to the complex numbers. Now, these use a plane due to addition, and it uses the cyclic abelian group Z4 for multiplication. So now we see why the complex numbers are written in a plane, because we have to connect i to i triple through 0, and we have to connect 1 to i squared through 0. 
everybody connects to zero. So this actually starts to look like a star. We can see that the zero on the multiplication graph theory starts looking more complicated. And we get this nice little boxy thing with the four little loops on the end and a cross down the middle and lots going on there. But the thing is that we're not going to be able to do any physics in just classical 3D space using complex numbers because that's just a plane. So what is done universally in physics is to, to talk about you, uh, constructing a vector space over the mathematical fields of real or complex numbers. And if you do it over real numbers, you're probably doing classical physics. And if you're using complex numbers, you may be doing quantum mechanics. But the numbers by themselves just can't even do the classical stuff. So why do we like use numbers that can like do 3D out of the box? Well, there is such a thing. We use the quaternion group Q8 to fill up 3D space. And there's actually a dimension there for time. And now the uh, star topology really seems to come into play. That really looks like a, a kind of almost, a, yeah, it's just, just very much a throwing star or something like that. Um, and if we look at the graph theory, we've got this uh, graph for zero that looks like some kind of uh, spider that would be scary if you ever saw it. Um, and the multiplication group uh, is... <laughs> It took me several weeks worth of work, with, but I've got the pipe cleaners and all that kind of stuff. Um, so, yeah, zero looks super complicated. Multiplication uh, is even more complicated. Uh, but let's not be afraid. Let's, let's do something. Let's do something simple, okay? So we're just going to square the space-time number, which uses this quaternion group Q8 for multiplication. Oh, my God. The invariant interval of special relativity is just sitting there. Now, if you go and do Google on the internet, you'll find people, uh, you'll ha find a discussion of this, and people will say, uh, that was just lucky. It's meaningless. <laughs> like, yeah, okay. What about the other term? Okay? I mean, it's, it's the next door neighbor. It's, it's got to be just as important. You can't say, wow, that one's hugely important in special relativity and lucky, and this other one, it, it doesn't do anything? It's like, no, I don't think so. So let's think about the special relativity thing. So you can walk towards or away from a pair of, of, of events. And this, these two observers, their measurements of the t time difference is going to be different because if you're walking towards it, it's going to look like those two events are a little, you know, shorter time between them. And if you're walking away, because you're walking away, it's going to say, hey, it's a little bit longer. And you say this similar things about distances and similar, uh, you know, it's either shorter or longer away. And we know from special relativity, though, if we do the calculation and calculate the interval, the intervals will be exactly the same. Now, the other three terms, which I call space times time, for pretty clear reasons, I hope, those numbers will be different. For if you're walking towards it, though the space time time numbers will be smaller. And if you're walking away, the space times time number will be different, uh, bigger. OK, uh, so my hypothesis is that if you're in different places in a gravity field, then you will agree to the space times time. Now, you're not going to agree on the interval. <laughs> the intervals are going to be different. OK, so if you're floating up above there, oh, your heart is free to tick faster and your your ruler gets bigger. Well, if you're now looking at events and you've got this um, fastly ticking heart, uh, the time difference is going to look like it's bigger. Uh, 
But your, with your large meter stick, the distance between them is going to be smaller. And if you're viewing it from below, so your kind of heart is crushed uh, by gravity, uh, you're, it's ticking slower, and your, your meter stick has is, is really gotten tiny, then you're going to say, wow, time seems to slow down between those two events as far as I'm concerned. And the distance, though, the distance looks larger. Okay, and it's just so my hypothesis that those exactly cancel out. So your space times time is the same, but your intervals will be different. So we're dealing with special relativity and gravity as problems in algebra, not in field theory. What's great about this is that there's like no field. There's no graviton. There's no quantum gravity. <laughs> it's great because the math is far simpler. Now, it's not totally simple. I mean, there's so many wonderful, strange uh, questions that come up in special relativity, and there's no reason why such similar kinds of puzzles aren't going to happen here if we uh, conserve this space times time value. Uh, but there are no nonlinear differential equations. <laughs> but what's bad for me, for my team, is that uh, tensors and metrics are absolutely everywhere in physics. And convincing the uh, convincing anybody that we should just, you know, redo the accounting, well, that's kind of a crazy task. Uh, but logic is forcing me here. And I'm pretty happy with the results so far. They, they, they've got an elegance that's, uh, that's very hard to find. So uh, thank you for your time.